I'm one of five children and growing up in our house, the dinner table was like one of those TV shows where they get a panel of people together who disagree on almost everything and then just see what happens. And over the years, we all learnt the exact moment that a fight would lead to a storm out, the joy of a joke to diffuse the tension, and we all became very familiar with the line, it's not what you said, it's how you said it. So I've ended up basing my career on understanding group dynamics. And now that I've said that, I'm wondering whether all of my work is just an attempt to come to terms with my family. But that's probably another, another conversation for another day, probably with a professional. <laughs> Thank you for laughing at my jokes. When I try out my jokes on my husband, he says, yep, yeah, that's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so if you think about it, our experience of family dynamics combined with our experience of the school playground and the many classrooms we've been involved in teaches a lot of what we need to know about human behaviour. By the time we're in our early teens, most of us have already done an apprenticeship in reading the room. When I left university, I learnt to read a different kind of room, a courtroom. I was a criminal lawyer, and you would think that courtrooms run on rules and procedures, and they do to a point but they also run on human emotion. The judge's tone of voice, the facial expressions of the jury, and the lawyer's ability to persuade. Being in that job was like being dropped in a pinball machine. I was working for the prosecution. I was allocated to a lot of sexual assault and child sexual assault cases. And every trial felt like an emo emotional roller coaster, and I wasn't even at the center of it. I remember one particular pre-trial meeting with a victim and she was recounting a harrowing story of child sexual assault. She was crying inconsolably, and as I handed her the tissues, I was fighting back tears myself. After the meeting, I called my husband. He's a chef, and he just opened a new restaurant. I started crying on the phone, and I said, I don't know if I can do this job. It's too hard. I don't think I'm suited to it. And then at the end of the conversation, I said, anyway, what are you doing? And he said, peeling potatoes. <laughs> that was the moment I realised that you shouldn't cry every week because of your job. And I also thought there's something going on in how I'm connecting to this job that's different from my colleagues. Looking back on it, I thought I was unsuited to that job because I was being too empathetic. But now I realise, knowing what I know, that I was only doing the first stage of empathy. I was doing empathy wrong. Empathy has three stages. Stage one is sharing the emotions of someone else, feeling their feelings, sharing their pain, putting yourself in their shoes. But stage two is understanding that there is a boundary between us and the other person, understanding that our experience is not their experience. And then stage three is being able to regulate our response to them based on those first two stages. I was only doing st stage one of empathy, and the interesting thing is that research by Batson and others tells us that when we are only doing stage one of empathy, it can bring us personal distress. And then ironically, we can shut down. We stop wanting to empathise because it becomes an uncomfortable process. And we see this happen a lot in the caring professions. But whatever I was doing wrong, I'm grateful for the experience because it forced me to take the plunge in researching human behaviour and how people connect. My research turned into a PhD and I now lecture and research in leadership. I explore how to read and lead the room. Reading the room is a skill that has evolved over the last 200,000 years of human history. People read the room in order to physically survive. If you are a soldier, a police officer, or you live with abuse and violence in your life, then you need to read the room in order to stay alive. We also read the room for our emotional survival and well-being. An abundance of research now tells us that our happiness is linked to our feeling of belonging and social connectedness. So we read the room in order to connect with each other, in order to feel like we're part of the same experience. And as I speak, People in robotics institutes around the world are teaching robots how to understand human emotions. So reading emotions is a skill. 
Reading the room can be easy, particularly when we're not involved in the dynamic. When we're not involved in the dynamic, we can be objective. We can notice all the signals. We can see people's facial expressions, their body language, their posture, their tone of voice. Have you ever marveled at how good you are at making decisions for other people? <laughs> how good you are at looking at someone else's life and saying, well, clearly this is what you need to do. Particularly with uh, parenting decisions, uh, I always get this look when my children are in shopping centres and they're running like crazy people or, you know, just male children uh, or even female children for that matter. I get this look from people like, like, really? Are you really letting your children do that? Because it's easy when we're not part of a dynamic. We can clearly see what's going on. We bring our conscious mind to understanding what's going on. We can be observant, calm and reflective. It's easy to spot, for example, a situation of abuse. Or it's easy to spot exactly what a sports team should be doing differently when we're not playing. Something happens when we become part of the dynamic. We stop using that conscious, reflective, calm mind, and suddenly we start using the unconscious mind. To demonstrate what I'm talking about, I'm going to get a group of people here up on stage with me to dance. And the organisers have been really great. They've agreed to come around and choose some people to start off with, just randomly from the audience. OK, so for anyone experiencing panic, shock, horror, and dread at the thought of coming up here, don't worry, I'm not serious. This is just a thought experiment. <laughs> but I... <laughs> Lock the doors. <laughs> what I hope that demonstrated is that once you became part of this dynamic, the thought of you coming up here on stage, something happened. Did something happen? You were flooded with emotion, probably the same emotion that's going through my body at the moment. You were flooded with emotion. And when we are flooded with that emotion, we stop thinking consciously and we go into snap judgments and we start making unconscious decisions. As soon as we're part of the dynamic, we start asking questions like, what box can I put you in? When have I been in this situation before? What does this remind me of? And then some more fundamental questions. Can I trust you? And do I feel safe with you? Now, these can lead to tiny choices, like who we sit next to at a social function, or how appropriate a joke might be to tell to a particular person. But it also leads to bigger decisions, such as who we hire, whether we grant home loan applications to someone whose name sounds differently from ours. What happens if we make those snap judgments if we're holding a gun or a teenager's self-esteem in our hands or if we're holding a judge's gavel? What happens to snap decisions then? Interestingly, interestingly, once you've had a lot of experience, remember Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours rule? Once you've had that level of experience, your snap judgments start to make sense. Because if you think about the questions, what box can I put you in? What does this remind me of? Where have I seen this before? They're really helpful questions for a doctor to ask, for example, or a police officer to ask if they've had the requisite experience. But the takeaway is this. We often can't trust our snap judgments. Bringing that conscious mind is always important. I, I ask you this question, who do you think among us are the best at reading the room? Which group of people? You might be thinking spies, soldiers, mothers, kindergarten teachers, and it's none of those. The best among us at reading the room are young children. And it's not because they have some special gift, it's because they're willing to experiment and explore with human connection. They'll poke you in the eye, or tap you on the face, or stare at you for an uncomfortably long period of time <laughs> until they understand who you are and what you're about. And I actually don't recommend <laughs> trying their, those strategies, especially in the workplace. Don't go up to your colleagues and just stare at them. <laughs> I'm trying to understand what you're about. As adults, we need different tools for human connection. We need to be able to understand the room. And I've actually created an empathy tool. What this does is that it shows us 
how we like to connect. Because as someone who's been in classrooms for the last 10 years, I can see as soon as I walk in, in the first five minutes, I can start to identify the way different people like to connect. Now, most personality tests that we do, they tell us about who we are as people, as individuals. What they don't do is they, te they don't tell us how we like to connect with others. And so my model is an attempt to do that. So you can see here, it's a four quadrant model with two axes. The vertical axis is the frequency of how you like to connect. Now, this is a preference. Do you like to connect a lot with other people? The top of the arrow, high frequency, means always, as in every waking moment. And the bottom means, I like animals. <laughs> <laughs> the middle means, I like to connect with people sometimes. Now, this isn't about how often you're forced to connect with other people. If you work full time, but you'd prefer to live in a cabin in the woods, then this is what this measures. Now, we need to use this in two ways. You work out your preference, and then you work out how you're forced to connect in different relationships, teams, and groups. OK, the intensity axis, the horizontal axis, axis is all about the size of your social network, how long it takes to get to know you, and the topics you like to talk about. So in the high intensity side over here, we have what is the meaning of life. On the low intensity side down here, we have how's the weather. <laughs> so I say people on the, the left hand side of intensity, they connect through being together. On the right-hand side of intensity, they connect through talking. OK, so I'll go through the, the four types really quickly. Top right, I call them the sunlight types. They are the sunlight types. They're the sunlight of human connection because they can light up a room, but they can also be that uncomfortable, blinding light that you need sunglasses or you need to look away from. <laughs> In conflict, these people turn into lightning or an electrical storm, and the only advice is just take cover. <laughs> My husband can attest to that. Um, OK, then we move to the, the, it, the ocean of human connection. So high intensity, low frequency. These people are like a refreshing, lapping wave around your ankles every time you connect with them. They're very nurturing connectors, but then like the ocean tides, they retreat and withdraw into self-care. I always find myself, if you haven't guessed yet, by the way, I'm a high frequency, high intensity type. Uh, whenever I tell my friends that, they're like, no. Uh, I always feel with ocean types so needy because I chase down the wave, like, take me with you. And the ocean types, no, no, I need, I need self-care here. Uh, in, in conflict, ocean types withdraw further and then they come back with a pounding and crashing wave. Now we move over to the trees of human connection, low intensity, low frequency. So these people are, uh, they prefer, a lot of the connection is below the ground. It's almost imperceptible. They're very enigmatic, non-verbal connectors. Mark Zuckerberg, founder of Facebook, he de he's dedicated to his life to creating an entire non-verbal social network. So typical tree of human connection. Uh, these people are often very observant and often have the last word because they're watching. They're able to bring that conscious mind to human connection more often. And then finally, we have the rocks of human connection. Each interaction with them, because they're high frequency, low intensity, is like sand slipping through your fingers. But then over time, the frequency of interaction turns into rocks and becomes very solid. Now, I always know when I'm around a rock person because they give me this like glazed look in their eye. And I was at school drop off the other day. Yes, it was 8.30 in the morning, but I was talking about my research. I thought that was appropriate. And I was talking to who I know is now as being a sand type. And she started backing away from me and said, happy Friday. <laughs> and the first thing I thought, being high intensity, high frequency, was you're a rock type. And then I think she just <laughs> jumped in a car and left. OK. so. This is a tool for reading the room, so you can spot all the different types as soon as you see them. Uh, it is also a leadership tool because we can use leadership to build common ground. And that's how I actually define leadership, as building common ground. So here we, here we see the four ways this can be used as a leadership tool. Number one, it predicts who the leader will be. In any team, we, we always have the, the leader as the alpha, right? Now, when you think about the definition of alpha, people often define alpha as the strongest, the smartest, the most beautiful. In fact, alpha is de defined as the most representative. So if you have four tree types in a, in a team, the most representative leader for them will be a tree type. It won't be the loudest. The leader is not always the loudest in the room. 
This is a point to remember. Okay, moving on, diversity. I think the most high-performing teams, thriving families, always have a diversity of connection types in the family or in the team. So when you're hiring, hire for all the types. You want the critical voice. Don't just hire, don't just surround yourself with people who are like you or remind you of you. Same goes with friendship groups. Then we move on to creating and naming dynamics. A lot of leaders are afraid of conflict. When you are afraid of conflict, it just pushes it further under the rug and it becomes something else. It becomes toxic, it becomes a toxic culture. The leader has to have the courage to name the dynamic, name the tension in the room. And then finally, experimenting and exploring. I'm not talking about the poking in the eye or tapping on the face. Talking about follow the oxytocin. <laughs> if you remember one thing from today, follow the love and connection hormone. When the team is connecting well, that is how everyone will be feeling. When, is the, when the team is not connecting well, it'll be more like the cortisol, stress hormone, pressure. I've invented a new term for leadership based on this model and empathy and human connection, and it's called all-in leadership. If you think about the current model of, of leadership that we have, it's based on the first ever academic model that was in a textbook, which was called the great man theory. The great man was tall, charismatic, with a booming voice. As a short woman, I'm glad we're moving on from this model. But how far have we moved on? We still see leadership as being at the top of a ladder. All in leadership reconceptualizes leadership as being at the center of a ripple effect. So many lives have been constructed in certain ways because of this ladder to power hero worship idea that we have of leadership. All in leadership is the idea of all of us seeing ourselves as leaders, as pushing all of our chips in like they do in poker. I don't hang out a lot in casinos, but I've seen movies. <laughs> it's always very dramatic. We are all in, we lead with our heart and mind, and everyone is a leader. I was at the shops the other day with my toddler and he dropped a spoon and I was sort of twisting myself to pick it up off the ground and a lady came over and she picked it up for me and she said, we've all been there. And I almost wanted to cry when she said that because it was so much more than just picking up a spoon for me. She was activating, she was living out all in leadership. She was saying to me, you belong here, your son belongs here. We're all in this together. Thank you.